Welcome to Normal Sampling. This video discusses sampling theory and practice with an emphasis on heterogeneity. I gave this presentation to the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality and they were kind enough to videotape it. So let's get into it. This next module is probably going to open a few eyes. It's one of my favorites. It's called Sampling Theory and Practice. This was developed, as I mentioned earlier, in the mining industry because it's a very profit driven industry and there were hard business cases that we could develop to show it was worth investing a little bit more in the sampling than it was having a bad year-end number on the bottom line for silver, gold, copper, even a coal corporation. And this same type of sampling technology rolls into basically any industry. And just kind of the, the hint up front is it all depends on, on two things. One, the concentration of what you're looking for. If you're looking for stuff in 5, 10, 20 percent, probably not so much. But if you're looking for trace elements defined as things below one part per million or 10,000, I'm sorry, yeah, 10,000 parts per million uh, or one percent, and most of the time we are in the environment, sometimes down even below one part per million, then it really applies. So trace elements. And the other aspect of it is geared toward particulate materials, soils, composting and amendments, silts, uh, sediments, and so on, that have a lot of heterogeneity. And you'll hear that word a lot over the next uh, few minutes here, is heterogeneity. Now, Tressa, should I start now with the questions that came up over the break? Let me just throw out a couple things we heard during the break related to the data quality objectives. One, on the remote monitoring, it was mentioned that if you're not really in an enforcement situation, the extra data may not be necessary. They may be interesting, but they're not necessary. And I know we're doing projects where at their DOE sites they have like a I won't mention the parameters you can guess, but radionuclide plumes, okay? And they know it. They're below state levels, but they want to know if they're getting better or worse. They don't have to enforce anything. But one of these is thinking about putting in a permeable reactive barrier so we can measure water quality, measure, measure water chemistry. That might be a business case. But just knowing the interesting stuff that might just be a PhD project. So you've got to, you kind of got to have the business case to go along with it. The second one, it was a lagoon mentioned that has uneven topography, that mounds and hills, so to speak, for various reasons arise uh, just the way this facility operates. And the regulated party needs to estimate the volume. And they take a certain amount of data, which may or may not be sufficient, and they say it'll be X number of tons. And they come to the regulator and they say, well, we don't think it'll handle that or that's too low. And so then they all get in, you know, this kind of situation. This is a great example of why the DQO process should be used up front. A phone call or a, a, an hour meeting might solve that before people go out, spend the money, come in, find out you don't, the regulator doesn't like it, and then we get all into the headbutting contest. Okay. These global issues may be able to be solved up front. I also had, as I mentioned, a few statistical kind of tricks I can pull out of my bag. They may help either party. I don't know. I can never predict whether it's going to be good for the regulator, good for the regulated party, whether it will save money, cost more money, but it will apply the objectivity uh, in the decision making that we talked about. So kind of ruminate on that. Uh, this particular uh, module is, I hope, going to open your eyes a little bit. And it's a little scary, but there's good news here is that we now we know a lot of the reasons we have these sampling problems and how to mitigate to the extent possible the errors that are involved. And actually, it can cost more money, but a lot of times it doesn't cost any more money. In fact, one of the success stories at Savannah River, and we'll see in the case study, is that we saved them at least $30 million just by kind of rearranging the way they went about sampling. And it saved them millions. So, as I said, 
I can never predict, but if you don't do it, you tend to get uh, headbutting situations. So the sampling theory, this originated, as mentioned, in the mining industry. Miners are out there exploring for precious metal of various types. It's a risky business for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is they have extreme heterogeneity in the materials, i.e. the rock, that they're sampling. Now, you can, there's a lot of types of, say, gold properties. You can have vein gold, where it, it goes along the cracks and crevices, and you have sometimes sheets or nuggets or you know, big pockets, uh, sometimes very thin or very narrow, that you maybe mine with a uh, underground situation, or maybe you come in from a surface mine and do that. But anyway, if you drill down and they use like one inch, two inch, rarely three inch core, you might miss it or you might get the nugget. So how do you deal with that? And if you get the nugget, and gold is really insidious because if you happen to get a little nugget in that volume and you put it in a little puff mill and you put it, you know, ground it into flour, guess what happens? I remember seeing a, you know, a Mr. Science deal where they took a Kruger in and they rolled it out into this big sheet about the size of that sign back there. And the guy could stand in front of the sheet of gold that was so thin, he could see right through it. Same thing happens in the puck mill. The host rock dissolves and becomes powder. The gold, it just flattens out. So when you go in and you take that, say, a one gram sample and put it into the AA, the uh, analysis, the flame, flame analysis, fire assay is what I'm trying to say. You might get that little nugget or you might not. And so most of the stuff we deal with is going to disperse. Now, there's more problems, but in gold, you really have a big problem. In fact, I just read an article last week about they have standard reference materials, certified reference materials for gold. Even they have large amounts of variability. It's insidious. We can do better. And we're going to find out the reasons beyond that simple nugget effect. And so the miners were faced with this. And as I said, it's an economic driver to mitigate the consequences. And as I also mentioned, the detrimental effects really occur when you're in trace elements or below 1% or about 10,000 parts per million. For instance, if you're trying to find diamonds, it's essentially a type of nugget. You want the biggest core possible and as many of them as possible because you're going to have a lot of misses. And you need a, quote, representative sample. Well, what is a representative sample in, in diamonds? And they're costly, let me tell you. You know, it's hard rock that you have to core through, and that's expensive. So there's a lot of money invested. Gold, same thing, nuggets. Well, in the environment, we have things like, they call them energetics. These are explosives. Army facilities, bombing ranges, have TNT and other types of uh, explosives that they want to get rid of. And turns out a lot of those form little particles, sometimes big particles, and we'll see them. In fact, several times I'll show you. On a more massive scale, bombing ranges have shells that are maybe at the surface. Or maybe it's a 500-pound bomb at 15 feet. And when they do the electromagnetic survey, you can't really tell if it's a mortar shell at one foot or a 500-pound bomb at 15 feet. So there's uncertainty right there. But it's what I call a fractal quantity. We'll talk about that, too, because a fractal is nothing more than something that shows the same type of pattern at different scales. Okay, On the massive scale, medium scale, micro scale, down. This is part of the challenge that we deal with. I have to use the same statistics essentially to estimate how many bombs are at a bombing range as I do, say, one millimeter particles of TNT in a TNT washout facility. So that's a big scale challenge. That's part of the boundary issue in the BQOs. That's part of the constraint issue that we need to do up front. It's, it's similar to the, the, uh, the volumetric issue. And, and I'll talk about that, too, in the case study for Savannah River, because we had mounds, just as uh, I happened to discuss over the break. Based on the title of my book, it won't surprise you that I was doing geostatistical analysis in mines when I started my career. 
And a lot of that is three-dimensional modeling of little blocks, okay, that you mine. You know, you don't mine by sampling. That's too expensive. Miners do the drilling. They estimate the ore body, and then they blow it up and cut it off to the mill. And we make these three-dimensional models. You can think of them as sugar cubes, all stacked together kind of things. And it turns out sometimes we estimate the ore is waste and the waste is ore. Not a good thing. And I knew from just doing contours, say on a bench, that you mine by benches, that you know you get these little bullseyes of high values and you get little bullseyes of low values because you missed the nugget of gold or silver or whatever. And you know it's like, I know this stuff is sporadic and all that good stuff, but I think we could do better. One day I was at Montana Tunnels. This is just outside of uh, Helena, Montana. And the geologist came in and said, Jeff, I went to the bench the other day and I went to 12 different blast holes and collected a big bag of material from the cuttings before they put it uh, with the, the explosives in. And he said, I divided each of those bags of material into 10 aliquots. And I sent 10 times 12, 120 aliquots to the laboratory. And he had a sheet and I was looking at it hole by hole. And he was receiving values ranging between four and six orders of magnitude in difference between the highest and the lowest gold, silver, copper, lead uh, concentrations in that same blast hole. And he said, how do I know where to mine? Because that's a big deal. In a mine, you usually contour the bench. You say, OK, here's the ore. Here's the waste. You know, when you blast it, you blast it so the ore stays with the ore and the waste goes over here, you, get, you know, because you don't want to mix it a lot. I said, I have no clue. I have no clue. But I said, you know what? I've had this same problem contour. You know, I get these bullseyes, high, low, and it's like, what's going on here? What's the source of the problem? Well, that's when I discovered the sampling theory. And it was actually discovered in France by a gentleman named Pierre G. This is him. Uh, he just died in November. He was uh, a contemporary of ours. He developed this whole thing. He's written books. And also uh, another French gentleman named Francis Petard, whom I worked with in Denver. Uh, they've both written wonderful books, uh, more than one. And they really pioneered this industry. I, got, I learned everything I know from these two guys, basically. They're very good. They quantified it. They are both chemists. Okay? They worked in the mining industry but they're chemists by trade. And Pierre G recognized that the particles of gold, silver, and the gang material were all contributing in, as it turns out, seven, well, actually six, plus human error, uh, six different ways of heterogeneity and how we need to manage that so that we can get better samples. So you can imagine, it gets a little complicated. But within our lifetime, these guys turn the mining industry on its ear in terms of sampling, sometimes recommending several tons of material that needed to be collected as a sample, you know, crushed, resampled, subsampled, crushed again, subsampled, put in the puck mill, sent to the fire assay, and, and so on. So it's a process, and managing that process was part of the breakthrough in sampling theory. And so Miners have huge volumes of ore to characterize, but sometimes we have huge volumes of hazardous waste, 10,000, 50,000, even if it's 500 tons. And we go out and we collect a little bit of a sample, a quart jar, maybe a less a lot of the times. And then we send a gram or a few grams, whatever, to the analytical instrument. We get an answer. What do we really know? Okay. Because we can have nuggets of explosives, we can have nuggets of PCB, we can have nuggets of all sorts of stuff, lead uh, going on. We worry about these things. Pierre and Francis group these into seven errors. At the core is the worst. It's called the fundamental error, FE for short. This is related to the heterogeneity of the material itself. How big are the particles? How big are the nuggets? And those two, and, and then related to how big a sample do you take? And when I say big, we'll talk about this a lot also, what I mean is mass or volume. Not, people say, 
how big should my sampling set be? Okay, well, that's a different question than how big physically the sample needs to be. We'll make that distinction. We'll see that dramatically, I hope, after lunch. So the fundamental error is the worst. It's also the most insidious because once you make it, you can never recover. There are certain areas that are certain errors that, you know, kind of luck of the draw. If you do things several times, on average, you'll, you'll gravitate toward the mean. Not necessarily true with the fundamental error. And because we do sampling and then sometimes uh, two or one or more sam subsampling processes, you can make the sampling error multiple times and they add up. But we do have a way to, to monitor what's going on. In addition, there's another one we'll focus a lot on. We really only have time to do um, fundamental error in what's called the grouping and segregation error. This is something that you'll be able to see uh, at the candy store, even at your dinner table. If you've read the manual, you know what I'm talking about. There are long range fluctuations. We know that if I take a sample here, this is actually the foundation of my geostatistical training. If I take a sample right here, I get an answer. If I take a sample right next to it, especially in gold, I could get quite a bit of variability between those uh, results. But if I take a sample here and I take one right there, these two probably are more alike than these two. And, you know, these two are more alike than this one and one where Tressa is. So as the distance increases, the variability and difference between samples increases. This is geostatistics. We can quantify that. We could spend a week talking about that. We won't. But the idea is there's a spatial relationship. And because there's these two are more alike than these two, than those two, that means there's a correlation here. A correlation is information. We can glean that information out using what's called a variogram and then impart that to our statistical analysis so that we can squeeze the error bars down and get better answers. That's the idea of statistics, is we want to find out where the errors creep in, how we can mitigate those, and how they impact the decision error. And mostly we mitigate that by, as we'll see, looking at the volume of material that we take, and then also, the, of course, the number of samples that we take to manage the variability. We also have, in a, in a three-dimensional, or it could be a linear case, periodic fluctuation. If you have a conveyor belt or any type of process stream, could even be in a pipe, could be biosolids, there could be variability over time. Sometimes it goes like this, sometimes it's unpredictable. Turns out sampling error can make you think you have a problem when you don't. You actually have a sampling problem. That's one reason we're here today. Okay, delimitation. We're going to talk a lot about increments. This is going to be a new term to some of you. People think about taking a sample. When I take a sample, I think about constructing a sample, not just taking a sample here. I might take little bits and pieces and construct it from several increments. Okay, So an increment is a portion of a sample. And the way we delimit it in three dimensions and this is part of what the DQO process talked about in establishing boundaries, it goes really, literally, right down to the sample itself or the sample increment itself. I know this is probably thinking, what's Jeff talking about? But uh, you'll see what happens in, later in this presentation. Then once you go to extract it, it turns out that a lot of sampling devices are not correct. And if they're not correct, you introduce another bias. That's an error, okay? Now the problem with bias is, at least when you're sampling, you never know if it's high or low. That's a bad thing. Sometimes in a lab, you have an instrument that biases high consistently, biases low, that we can deal with, we can adjust, okay? Or if you have a correlation, and think, well, it's not perfect, but I can do an error bar and I can adjust so that I don't make so many errors. With sampling, we never know what the bias is high or low. And finally, here's the human element. All these, I should mention, are based on heterogeneity, these six errors. The preparation error is humans. Okay, that's loss of material during processing, that's dropping it on the floor, 
you know, dilute improper dilution or, you know, saying it was diluted 10 times when it was really 100 times, you know, these sort of things that creep in, uh, they happen. Usually the lab's pretty good, but stuff happens. It can be just, it could be a slice through a conveyor belt, it could be a drill hole, it could be a tri sample that you put into a, a composting pile to take out some of the material. Those are categorized here. When we go to continuous model, that introduces the spatial aspect. And spatial could be, say, even one dimensional, as in a conveyor belt or a pipe, but it is a continuum of, of some sorts. And then again, we have the human factors down here, loss, contamination, yeah, contamination is another one. A lot of times you have the you have blanks. So that you want to figure out if the uh, volatile that you're reading actually was laboratory chemicals or whether it actually came from the field. Okay. Here's kind of an eye chart, but this is really technically how they're organized. I think there's a better picture of this in the actual white paper. Again, it's divided into the discrete model, the continuous model. Here we have long range and the periodic heterogeneities. Here we have the, uh, the constitution and the fundamental error. We have the distribution and segregation. We have the uh, short range variability, uh, short range heterogeneities. Then down here, the basically the boundaries, the increment delimitation and extraction. And finally down here is the, uh, what's the preparation? There's the preparation error down here. Okay. So we now have a model kind of like DQO seven step, we have another seven step process. We have a model for tracking where the air could be coming in to our sampling program. And so those of you who actually do the sampling or hire people who do the field sampling or who are here at the state and review sampling programs, you now have a model and say, hmm, I wonder how they handle this issue. Or, you know what, I'm not worried about this one for whatever reason, so it just helps organize. And as I say, there are economic implications to all these things. This was a very big issue, as I mentioned earlier, in the triad approach, because we were degrading, in a sense, the QC. That was a, a big argument. It went on for years that we're not getting the quality that we want. We'll see why here uh, shortly why that really isn't a concern. It was, it was a bit of a surprising result. It was, to me and other people who were in the industry, it was sort of intuitive, but when we really quantified it, it was like, oh yeah, now the light bulb goes off. And it's a very, very valid question to answer because you do worry about the quality of data. As it turns out, the sampling errors are the biggest error that you will commit during a characterization program. People have always focused, as I mentioned earlier, on the laboratory. It gets a lot of heat. And a lot of time, the lab gets blamed for what was really a sampling problem to begin with. And the analogy here is the old iceberg, where I guess, what, 90% of the, or only 10% of the iceberg is above the surface, and 90% is below. Well, usually 90 or more percent of the error in a sampling characterization program comes from the sampling, not from the analysis. Can you screw it up at the lab? Of course. But it's more likely to come during the sampling process than it is from the laboratory. In fact, in Katar's book, he said, it's not unusual in mining to have a thousand percent or more error. That's a lot. But this is why the fellow at Montana Tunnels brought me in gold concentrations that were spanning up to six orders of magnitude. That's a lot. That's more than a thousand percent. A whole lot more than a thousand percent. And so, you know, you're, you're kind of rolling the dice. You don't want to roll the dice. You'll see in some of my slides, PRG says, you know, don't, don't do that. We can do better. Now, we don't have infinite resources, but we can do better. And you can see that instrument analysis really isn't our biggest problem. EPA, and we all know about SW846. That's kind of our Bible to get the right method and the procedures. 
we now have some pretty darn good analytical instruments. We have QA, you know, out the wazoo. You know, PhDs have written them, they implement it, we train people. By and large, the labs do pretty well. But if you give them garbage, garbage in, garbage out. It's our responsibility as samplers to give them high quality data and high quality samples, which we will start to define. So really, as we said earlier, it's you know the field sampling that's a problem. The subsampling can be a huge problem as well, and to some extent, the sample prep. That's actually usually the least of our problems. That's more of a problem in in, in like especially volatile. We have loss, and uh, you know if you're monitoring lead in, in mine tailings or something, you don't lose the lead. VOCs, yeah, they get away. Here's what I was trying to tell them, and Petard was trying to tell them, and EPA finally came on their own. And I, I shouldn't say finally, it just, they're a regulatory agency, it takes time to you know, get everything through the system. But what they determined, and this is their diagram, or a, a modification of that diagram, is that 95% of the error comes from sampling. How many would have thought of that? That's kind of shocking, isn't it? That it really wasn't the laboratory. We all think about the lab messing up. It really happened before it got to the lab. You know, the sample was doomed. We're going to try and show you how not to doom your samples. And so what they did was they, they did studies. These actually came from uh, Army facilities where they were analyzing explosives in soils because they're particles of various types. And you can see that we have a central sample which is quite high. And doing field analytical, the on-site and the lab are pretty darn close. So in terms of order of magnitude, this is high. That's a little lower than the lab, but I get it. It's around 40,000 either way. Going around the, the, uh, the circle, so to speak, this one's, uh, these are both low. Again, this one's, this time the on-site's a little higher, the lab's a little less. Down here, we see this is more like this one. Oh, let me skip this one. These are low. Okay, so we have two that are low on the outside. Now we come back into the hot stuff. We continue into hot stuff again. A little more difference here. Again, these are pretty close. Now we're cooling down a little bit, about an order of magnitude, but they're, these are really close. And then we're back into the, the low-valued stuff down here. So this is really a one-foot circle. This can all happen in one foot. So it's like that guy at the mine. He was getting six orders of magnitude from the same pile of dirt, so to speak, or rock. You go out into the field, you've probably all seen it. You look down, there's different colors, or stains, or oil, or whatever. You think, what's representative? How do I know? If you sample one place, you know there's going to be a bias. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's, that's another question we'll address. So, this was a bit of a surprise, and this was a problem. When we started writing the guidance document for incremental sampling methodology, we got it basically all done, and it went for legal review, and everything came to a grinding halt, okay? Because legal knew that these techniques would be implemented under RICRA. Now, RICRA is very prescriptive, and that is really good for lawyers. They like things that are cut and dried. One thing is no compositing in a lot of cases, especially in soils. A little better on liquids. But in soils, we didn't have that very often. And so the idea was they recognized the fact that this was going to make their litigation, and this was NEIC, they're the prosecutorial arm of EPA. They're like, I don't want to do this. So we kind of messed around for, I don't know, two, three, maybe four years before we finally got the final guidance document around. But it, it's sort of typical, you know, the, uh, the folks who make these laws, a lot of them are attorneys. They set up the things. They're not necessarily based on the full picture of science. And then when science shows the full picture, it doesn't always match. But now the procedures are in place, and bucking the system becomes an effort and a challenge. So. EPA now recognizes this. They're on board. They like it. In fact, a lot of times they will insist on, on implementing these types of techniques. Okay. 
Here's another sort of picture of uh, that was then, this is now scenario in characterizing a site. You can see that if you have, uh, these are just goofy little uh, hot spots on say maybe a one acre site. If you go out and you use expensive forms of sampling and only take say half a dozen samples, you might find the corner of this one, but miss this one. But boy, you paid a lot of money and you got all the QAQC package and you could back up the analysis but you didn't do very well. And again, this is an EPA diagram. I didn't draw this. But this is what this is what regulators worry about. This is what the public worries about. I would worry about it if it were my neighborhood that they were trying to sample. Getting quality data, but not enough quality data. Whereas, if we go out with a less expensive and lower quality, so to speak, field sampling technique, which th these days <laughs> really isn't that much worse than the lab, we can get a whole bunch of samples. We can define the nature and extent of this much better in the field, and we can find this and even get a pretty good idea of it, its extent. And guess what? These cost dollars and these cost pennies over here. Okay. It isn't always this simple. This is the triad approach, but this is where we kind of proved out sampling theory. I mean, the miners proved it at the bank, they, they knew it worked, and EPA proved it by essentially drawing these diagrams, by looking at explosives situations and developing uh, a model, conceptual model. And I kind of likened it, liken it to, I don't know if you've been to the store that about 10, 20 years ago, these were really popular. Some MIT grad student or something developed a program. We could take little pictures, hundreds of thousands of them, and he, you know, run it through a photograph and he take the one picture that most represented a certain small area, or what I would call an increment. And then he'd plug it in. After doing these thousands of times, and sometimes he'd repeat a given photograph, sometimes he'd use just unique ones, he developed a, a picture. Now every cell, every essentially a sample, every increment in this picture is imperfect, just as probably every sample we ever take is going to be imperfect. But if you take enough of those and you put them together, as somebody did here, you get the picture. Everybody see who that is? That's kind of the analogy from the last slide, is we get a better picture with more samples. Now, we already knew that, but now we know that in some cases we have field analytical that can allow us to get more samples at a lower cost and still maintain what we would call good quality because we're going to look at this picture and say, oh yeah, that's Abraham Lincoln. It's not George Washington. Before, we may not have been able to tell the difference just based on a very limited number of samples. Now, if you're into mathematics, here's kind of the geeky aspect of it. But think about the Wizard of Oz and the Scarecrow. You know, he goes, what is it? some of the squares of the uh, other two sides are equal to the square of the hypotenuse, whatever it is, the Pythagorean theorem. Vectors add that way. We have the analytical uncertainty on the y-axis. At the laboratory, high quality data, it's a very small error. But as EPA has found, there are lots of uncontrolled sampling uncertainties. Therefore, the total uncertainty sampling plus analysis is large, reflected down here. Similarly, or actually uh, in a different, if we go with field analytical that doesn't have the QA quality and it's higher to maybe even three times higher, I wouldn't say it's usually that much, but just as an example, we control the sampling uncertainty by managing those seven errors from PRG. We reduce the sampling uncertainty. When we take the hypotenuse B, it's a lot smaller. And we clean up the site, and then when we go back, we can say, okay, now, for our confirmation samples, we'll use the lab. We'll get small errors at the lab. We control the sampling uncertainty in the field. We get small error there. Our confirmation samples have a high level of quality, both from the sampling and the laboratory side. So now we, we squeeze down our error margins quite significantly. 
and all we did was use the Pythagorean theorem. theorem. Okay. Similar slide here. Uh, again, draw this a lot of ways. We miss the targets a lot with the small sampling program, with the field analytical. We find them, we add the vectors, and uh, we decrease the variability before we remove the hotspots. Now, I mentioned the word heterogeneity. It turns out there were actually two different types of heterogeneity, and the distinction is pretty important. And we'll see different aspects of that here in the next few slides. You know, I'm really thankful that Pierre G did all this because you know he was lying in bed at night thinking about these issues that I had. I mean, I'd sort of experienced them, but I hadn't thought about them. Now we have them quantified. Compositional heterogeneity is actually what the material, as the name implies, composed of. What's the composition? Big particles, little particles, a lot of one material and just a little bit of another. What's the variation in size, fractions, and so on? Is it just clays or is it sand and clays? Or is it uh, rock with everything from clay up to uh, one inch size material and so on? That's the composition. It varies whether it's sediment, silt, rock, you name it. Uh, we'll see auto fluff, that's a real real hodgepodge where they grind up cars. But within the composition of any material, we find out that the particles, and there are always particles in these materials, the particles distribute differently. They do two things. Some of them group together, kind of clusters, and we'll go over this a lot. They cluster together, you always get clusters in statistics. And some of them segregate as groups, kind of massive clusters, if you will. So we have two different forms. What does this look like? The composition heterogeneity, or CH, is, again, what the particles are made of. Here we have kind of medium, large. We have small but flat, or medium but flat, tiny little guys. It's a hodgepodge. Typical stuff. You know, maybe this is a mica type thing. Maybe this is a clay particle that's flat. Maybe this is a, a sand, silt, whatever particle. But you can see they're all mixed up. Below, we see, oh gosh, okay, now they're starting to group and distribute themselves. The larger ones have come over here. This happens. And the smaller ones are here. This happens a lot vertically. If you pour material in a pile, the bigger material tends to roll off on the edges. Or I usually bring, and I didn't because of various aspects, but anyway, I have a model where you shake it. And it's got small and big particles. The big ones come to the top. So when you send a sample jar of soil, especially dry soil, it's on that FedEx plane, and you know it gets to the lab, and if you don't specify your subsampling protocol, guy opens the jar, takes a spatula, takes a few grams off the top, we bias the sample. It might have been a good field sample. Now you've biased it. Okay. And so if you have a pile, that's why we're here, sometimes these guys rise, sometimes they fall to the edges. Guess what happens to the little guys? They go down. Okay. You get stratification or various things. You have more going on in piles. We'll talk about that too. But the point is, things distribute, they cluster, they group, they segregate, they clump, and this causes a problem. As I said, statistical clusters are everywhere. And one of the things that uh, we'll show you a lot, but one thing that's not in our slides is do you have a lottery here in Idaho? Yeah, okay, okay. Right. If you watch, I know in Georgia they, they televise like twice a week the picks. And you got ping pong balls and they come out. And, you know, say it's like 1 to 30 or something. If you get, you know, 2, 8, 12, 20, you know, sort of a, an even distribution, no. You get 6 and 8, and then 20 and 23 and 30. They, they group or they cluster. Sometimes they're all low. This is the world of random numbers. 
and random selection. Things just clustered. And later today, we'll do a fun exercise to see how many clusters we have in this room amongst us and our birth dates. So it's a fact of life. And one of the, you know, the real breakthroughs of sampling theory is to determine how we mitigate and deal with these clusters, grouping, and segregations in the field. Here is an example of auto flow, where they grind up cars. And I'm talking seats and dashboards and batteries, and you know, it's a mess. It's also a hazardous waste. And you can see the particle sizes are very large. You know, there's a seat cushion, and you know, who knows what these things are. It's an enormous sampling problem. I still don't think we've solved it, because you have to have gigantic volumes. But it's like the epitome of the sampling problem. But not too far behind are explosives. You know, you can get big chunks of TNT or whatever explosive is, is in the shell or in your wash-off facility, and they're a problem. We'll see uh, during a case study of Pueblo that these go into a windrow composting pile. And after two weeks, somebody's going to go through and sample that pile and figure out if this has now been degraded and disappeared. Personally, I'm a doubting Thomas. And I recommended a incremental or composite, as they called it back then, sampling program. Couldn't do it under RECRA. So I'll tell that story a little bit later. But Tressa has a similar problem. She wants all those nasty biosolids, and you know, just kind of one of those too much information situations. I learned a lot about biosolids I really never wanted to know, but now I do. That's a problem, because you want to make sure all those little critters have gone away. You really do. So that, that impacts people. So we're going to learn how to manage those. PCBs are another one. Whether they're in piles, this is a lagoon. This was an infamous one. This is an iconic photo of the Bros Lagoon. I was on the litigation for Bros. They took five samples in a several acre lagoon uh, of the sediment down below. They had to go through this oily sludge layer, layer, which was known to be contaminated with PCBs. And you can see drums, wood. I mean, they had like, I think they said they had 10,000 gallon tank trucks and just all manner of junk, little, literally junk in there. So anyway, they go down, they take five samples. Most of them are 5, 10, 15, maybe 50 was the highest. Then there was up, one up at, I think like 2,500, you know, somewhere in that range, way above the incineration limit of 500. So based on one sample, which basically they later confirmed, and we argued, was probably cross-contaminated going through that oily sludge later, which was hot as blazes, they decided to build a half a million dollar incinerator. And when they fed the incinerator, they really couldn't find the hot material that they thought was going to be there in the end. They had a sampling problem. We knew it. I didn't have the theory back then to tell them about it. So it can cost. Those are taxpayer dollars. Here's something a little closer to home. If you've been out in the field and do core samples, this looked amazingly like copper. This is an EPA photo. I'm not sure what site this came from. If I had to guess, I think this was somewhere up in the Seattle area. But you see you have sort of a base layer, you know, gray and black. And then, oh, iron and copper, you know, this little greenish kind of stuff, bluish. Grouping and segregation. What is a representative sample of this material? That's a good question. Because if I sample... Just take a teaspoon and I sample this, I'm going to get one answer. If I sample this interval, I get another answer. If I sample, say, a one foot interval, arbitrary value, I get another answer. What is the answer? Okay. What is a sample, after all? So think about that. What is a sample? And what is representative of this material? Well, part of the answer is. What are you going to use it for? What decision are you going to make? How does the sample volume impact the risk decision that you will ultimately make in terms of human health? Are you worried about the pika kid who's going to grab this or the industrial worker who's going to be exposed to this? 
So there's a lot to think about in defining what a sample actually is or is not. And it happens, again, on fractal levels. This is another eye chart, but the idea is simply that at the microscopic level, okay, and we're talking about tiny aliquots, we're talking about tiny scales, we have particles of various types. They influence what's going on at the laboratory. They influence the field sample, they impact the subsample, they impact the analysis. So I'm trying to expose you to the fact that these particles are kind of insidious, but we now have techniques to manage those. I can show you by what happens at your dinner table. This is about the simplest way. I mean, it's kind of goofy, it's kind of cheesy, but it really happens because clustering is a natural phenomenon. If you take a substance with two quantities, like peas and carrots, sometimes I bring uh, a big urn, clear urn full of black balls and white balls, and I shake it up. And there's groups of black and groups of white, and you know, they're streaky and so on. I shake it up again. They just reform. Okay? I can shake it up till the cows come home, and I will still have groups and segregated areas of those black balls and white balls. They don't go away. It's not like a checkerboard where it's alternating here, and then the next row it alternates again, and it's a nice cross-checked pattern. It doesn't happen. So if you, you know, have go to the buffet or if you have these on your dinner table, look, you will find out you get groups of peas, you get groups of carrots. Okay? And it doesn't matter if the carrots are shaped differently, like clay particles or something. You get groups of carrots and you get groups of peas. This shows up in those heterogeneous particulate materials that we tend to sample within a soil pile or any kind of pile. Or even if it's not in a pile, if it's just if you're doing direct push or core drilling into the earth, you will encounter heterogeneity just as we did back here. You're going to find that. You're also having to think about, all right, this was maybe a three inch core. You know, what if we had taken a four inch core or a one inch core? Would we have missed it? So now we're thinking uh, a little bit differently. What is a sample? What is the influence? What is what is our conceptual model of grouping and, het and segregation? What is our conceptual model of heterogeneity? How much heterogeneity is going on? And if it's high, how do we manage it? Those are all questions that we face as we go into the field. Go into a candy store, gumballs, any type, gummy bears, it doesn't matter. Different colors, two colors, or ten colors. It doesn't matter. You get groups. You know, we have the yellow group. We have the green groups. Okay, we have the orange groups. We have sort of the semi white groups. Well, what happens if you're looking for the white ones? Or what happens if you're looking for the green ones? You can miss the green ones or the white ones. Or you can get a cluster of greens. It's kind of a nugget effect. This is what we deal with in the sampling scenarios. The good news is that we can manage this, even by equations. And this is one of the few equations we'll see. But it's very important to understand the fundamental error has an equation by which we can manage the heterogeneity and quantify how much error is associated with the fundamental constituents that are in the materials that we're sampling. In this equation, Fe is a fundamental error. And notice that it is a squared quantity, so it's essentially a variance statisticians like variances because we can add them. If you do subsampling, we're going to have one at the field stage and every other subsampling stage, even if there's only one, so I can figure out the total error. You really want that so that you can manage that error as we go through the process, or if you can't afford to, at least you can say, here's what we did, and here's why it would have cost 20 times to have, 20 times more to have the error it just wasn't a marginal return that was defensible. Now the equation has very few components. There is a sampling constant, 22.5, for the environment. This was developed by a fellow named Chuck Ramsey, who's really the preeminent kind of implementer. He does training, as I do. 
And he came up with this. Uh, in mining situations, you generally develop this sort of an arduous process. For the environment, we use 22.5. Makes it simple. D is the diameter of the largest particle. So what this is saying, notice this is in the numerator. As this gets bigger, what happens to our error? It gets bigger. So as the particle size increase, you get more error. And not only is it the size, it's the size cubed. So when you cube things, it's not a linear function. It's, it goes up very quickly, the error. Now, to mitigate the error, we put the mass down below. And we divide by the mass. So as the mass, or volume, or what we in the sampling world call support, the sample support is the physical mass or volume. It's not the sample size. Sample size is how many. The sample support is how much volume you extract. And it could even be water, although we usually don't have problems with water. But it's how much soil or rock or other partic particulate material you take out that's the mass in uh, grams, and we put that below. And so we try and get this number so that we keep at every sampling or subsampling stage about a 15% error. That's sort of a starting point. And that's a DQO starting point. Like in DQOs, you say, what's our level of confidence? Well, you usually start in a 95, maybe 90% confidence range, and you go negotiate. If there's not a lot of risk, maybe 80% will do. If there's a lot of risk, well, maybe we will want 99. At Umatilla, not too far from here, we were dismantling the bombs up there. And we wanted a lot higher confidence. Medical situations where they're going to put a new drug up, they want higher confidence. So it depends. But we negotiate all these things up front in the DQO process. And so you could end up needing pretty big samples. Okay, maybe a bucket full. Now, this guy's really doing it wrong because if you took a bucket full, you should pour that out and maybe do some mixing and then some subsampling. You shouldn't go to the bucket because what's he doing? He's just like the guy at the lab, picking it right off the top. Okay, he's biased. We took this big sample that was that met the parameters of this equation, and then the guy in the field messed it up. So not only do we have to have the math right. We have to have the protocols and procedures right to get the material we you know, painstakingly calculated and then extracted into the right format so that when it gets to the lab, it's in the right amount and it's in the right proportions in terms of the particles that are within that material. So one of the things we learn here is that there's more monitoring. Okay. But there are ways that this will actually produce cost-effective results. For instance, in mining, it is a total no-brainer to take big samples and put a little bit more into your sample collection and processing because you can waste millions of dollars by throwing your ore in the waste pile and processing ore and wasting reagents, time, crushing, you know, blasting, all that good stuff. Now, this is a, a chart from Chuck Ramsey that was developed years ago. Just a general idea, he came up with this. If you have a one gram sample mass, and I don't remember what material this was, but he got a 40% error. You double the weight, you only get a 10% difference, okay, or deduction, so to speak. Go up to five grams, you only have it over the original. Go up to 20 grams, then you get a fourfold reduction, but you have to do 20 times the amount. So it's not a linear function. Remember we talked about the diameter squared, or not the squared, diameter cubed. That's the effect that we're seeing here. Whereas we go up 20 times in the mass, we only get a fourfold reduction. So you had to go up five times to get one uh, sort of incremental advancement or deduction in the error. And this was also based on a maximum particle size of two millimeters. So basically sand size material. So if you've got stuff that's a centimeter, roughly half an inch, guess what happens to the air? Well, a lot. I would suspect these would be over 100%, if not, if not higher. 
here is what's called a nomograph. And this is, this is a very difficult diagram in a lot of ways. But and it, it is also another eye chart. The point of this slide is we have a way to calculate and manage the fundamental error as we go through these various field sampling and then subsampling stages. What we do is plot the weight in grams of the mass, actually, along here. So, you know, here we have uh, one gram and then uh, 10 to the fifth gram. So here's a massive sample. Here's a very small sample. We look at the uh, variability in the fundamental error along here and along here. We have diagonals, which are the diameters. We start small particle size, basically about, uh, and these are in centimeters. So this is about half a millimeter. And this is about two tenths of a millimeter, tenth of a millimeter, I'm sorry, one millimeter, two, and so on, up to about a centimeter. And so we can go to our chart and say, all right, I'm going to go to the field at point A. And I'm going to collect or sieve after I collect a sample that is about, sorry, this is about half a centimeter, 4.475, close to half a centimeter, is going to be my largest particle in the field. And when I look down, I see that I need between 10 to the fourth, which is what, uh, about five kilograms, okay, about 10 pounds of material from the field. That's a fair amount. You know, it's more than you put in those little, little jars. Okay. One of the reasons is we selected half a centimeter. Maybe if we screened it out, we could uh, get a little bit less. But there may be reasons not to screen it out as well. But if that's our choice, and this was developed on a mining situation, not really looking at risk, but looking at economics, we see that we probably don't want to send that much to the lab. So we want to create a subsample to send to the lab. Well, we also want to limit the fundamental error. And we want it to be limited to 0 0.015, okay, or about 15% error. So we put a bar, kind of an error bar here. And we say, how much of the original sample can we take and still maintain a 15% fundamental error on the, given these particle sizes? And that turns out to be, oh, probably maybe two, three, four kilograms, two, three kilograms, so less. That's good. Now, the lab is not going to use that unless we do the silly thing like taking 10 grams off the top. So in order to mitigate the fundamental error, what we do is reduce the particle size, crushing, grinding, whatever method works. And we reduce it to 0.17 centimeters, and that's a lot smaller. And so the fundamental error drops. But then, especially in mining, that's still not good enough. And you know, this is a, an equipment-based decision, essentially. Again, we extract the least amount we can to maintain a, a fundamental error of 15% at this sampling point, and then maybe we put it in the puck mill something and we reduce it again we reduce it, reduce it down to 0 0.04 centimeters okay so it keeps getting smaller and we can continue the exercise by subsampling reducing particle size subsampling this is the final sample it goes to the analytical instrument we can manage that and because the fundamental error was squared you do the sum of variances you add up however many steps were and the squared error at each of those steps, take the square root, and there you go. You've got the total error. Okay. Now, fortunately, when you sum the variances and take the square root, um, it's a lot smaller than if you just add up, say, standard deviations. So that, that mitigates the error. But this is the only way, at least to date, that we are able to calculate how much field sample mass. You wouldn't have to take this much. This might have been a front-end loader bucket. And you don't tell the guy, take half of one. You know, he takes the whole one, okay? And then, all right, we deal with it. We take it down, we only need this much, and we run it through a crusher, do it again, do it again, and then you know, we, we get on toward the final field analysis. We can manage 
the amount of error and keep it at 15%. So maybe you end up with, I don't know, say 20%. But that's a lot better than 1,000, 10,000. You can have 10,000% error in the sample. So it's not a magic bullet, but it gives us a solid basis and a framework for managing error that is related to sampling. Of course, once it gets to the laboratory over here, then you get into their world and their rules and their QHQC procedures. But now we're starting to develop on the sampling side our own set of QA procedures. How much do we take in the field? Well, that's equipment, okay? Now this is crushing, okay? Again, equipment, crushing. And how we probably don't go past about here in the environmental world. But we can manage our error uh, based on what we have in terms of equipment. And some of this can be done in the field. We'll talk about that later. Some of it's best done at the laboratory. Uh, the big stuff can be maybe some sieving in the field. The, uh, the puck mill, you probably want to do that at the laboratory and so on. So it's a complicated diagram, but it's a very valuable diagram, something we never had before. I'll let you read that question in just a minute. This is a question that's very surprising. And the answer is maybe even more surprising. That the mass of the sample determines the statistical distribution of the data. This is not intuitive. I think even for statisticians, because they're used to doing, you know, you read about in the stat class, the white balls and the black balls in the urn. You pick them out. Maybe they're 50-50, maybe they're, you know, 10% of one, 90% of the other. Things are very ordered. You pull one out, you know what it is. But we don't really know when we pull a sample core what it is exactly, unless we've defined it. And so, that ends up biting us in the behind sometimes in the statistical distribution, at least in soils. As I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're looking at contaminants in groundwater, they're skewed. A lot of times that's non-detects. That's a good thing. In soils, usually they're not non-detects, or many times they're not. And so we try to get normal distributions if we can because the statistics become much easier. So the answer is true. The physical mass or the sample support actually influences our distribution. We'll see a few distributions here in a couple slides. But here's the fundamental basis for that statement. And in fact, it's a reality. This is what I call the dots diagram for simplicity. And you can see that we have a material. And this looks, by the way, very much like the material we're going to sample after lunch. And this is where I got the idea to do the dots diagram. Because I told you I was a doubting Thomas. And I said, all right, I got to do it. I got to prove it. What we see is a fairly common scenario where you have particles. Now, these could be some micron gold particles. They could be little TNT nuggets, one millimeter in soils. They could be our little pasta things. They could be anything up to uh, the bomb on a bombing range. And this could be dozens of square miles. So it's fractal, okay? This could happen at any level. Doesn't matter what the size of the particle is, a 500 pound bomb or submicron particle of gold. When you take a small sample, and small sample, I mean small sample support, such as this, or this, or this, or this, what happens? A lot of the time, in fact, four out of nine, close to half the time, you miss it. There's nothing like sampling TNT in soil where you can see the coloration of the TNT and have the lab send you a result that says non-detect. You'll go crazy. You can see it. You know from the color it's in there. Okay, But if you didn't get it in the field, you're not going to get it in the subsample. You're not going to show it on the analytical instrument. Small samples are dangerous. Small samples most of the time produce low or zero values. And in statistics, we have the mean, median, and the mode. The mode is the value that occurs the most often. And so here, it's not quite the mode, but very close to most of the time, 
you're getting nothing. When in fact, there is stuff there. Not a good situation. Now let's imagine that your action level is three particles. Pick an arbitrary number. So we go up to the next step. We see now one, two, three, four times, equal number four out of nine, we get one particle. We're below the action level. So eight out of nine times, we have numbers that are coming back and say, you're good. Everything's hunky-dory. We do not have a problem. Houston. Then Apollo 13 calls in three particles. Houston, we have a problem. We talked about clustering. Every once in a while you get these clusters, or most of the time you get clusters. What happens when this sample goes to the lab and the result gets reported? Let's say you got process control. Everybody goes, oh my goodness, you know, things out of control, process is out of control, we have a problem. No, it's not a laboratory problem. It's not a process control problem. It is a sampling problem. It is pure and simple a sampling problem because you had too small a sample support and you're rolling the dice. If you're not trying to find something for some sneaky reason, a lot of time you'll get away with it. Or if you have a high enough action level, even when you get one, it's only going to be one. But every once in a while you get this guy. That's the guy you have to watch out for. Now, if you go up, as we see in the next diagram, to a larger sample support, then in every case we start to get some particles. Now, this one only has two. This one's got quite a few. But at least there's something there. That's going to give us a little bit. I mean, this is almost a binary distribution. It's there or it's not. Well, especially, in, as I mentioned, in stuff where you can see by color, by oil, or whatever, that there's material there that you don't want, this doesn't work, the binary system. So you want to be capturing at least some material that has the contaminant of concern within your sample, and certainly in the subsample. Now, if you were to go up to a sample this size, support, it's great. Okay. Now, there may be reasons logistically or for cost reasons that you can't go up that way, but at least here, you're getting at least a couple of little particles all the time. And so, we also talk about the conceptual model of heterogeneity. Maybe you're looking for bigger particles. This is what I was worried about at Pueblo Chemical Depot. Those, you know, when they, I was told they went out and collected all the fist size or larger nodules of TNT with little Easter baskets, okay? But that would have been a fun job. So anything less, say golf ball size stuff, went into the pile. And after 14 days, they wanted to sample it and make sure all the particles were gone. It's a 200 foot windrow. I said, well, how are you gonna find these? How are you gonna find these things? They're small. I'm trying to find, you know, even if it's a marble size, even if it's a golf ball, it's going to be hard to find a golf ball in a 200-foot windrow this high. They said, no, 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 Rucker, we can't do composite sampling. So take a big sample. No, too hard. We don't have the device. But here you have a problem. You're searching. This is a search sampling problem. Tressa has that. Other people will have that. You're trying to find pockets or nodules of material that causes you concern. In a gold situation, this is the profit. And the mind-boggling aspect is Francis Petard has many times figured out that this is the conceptual model of heterogeneity for a gold mine and told the people, you know, all that waste you're throwing over the side of the hill, don't. Lower your cutoff grade. Miners always have a cutoff grade that's based on economics. Ounces of gold per ton times the gold price makes it profitable based on how much it costs per ton to uh, mine and extract the, the mineral. Okay, And so you never send to the mill stuff that's below the cutoff grade. Okay? It doesn't make sense. He will tell people, lower your cutoff grade. They think he's nuts. Well, what's happening 
as they're doing all this sampling, even with stuff, even with supports at this size, and most of the time they don't find it. But it's out there. And so there are ways to determine whether you have this kind of a model or this, or something different, or some combination. And there's our challenge. There's an infinite number of conceptual models of heterogeneity. And we never know for sure, but we have to start somewhere, even if it's peas and carrots, is, is what we do. And so to go back to that, oh, OK, one more. This is coal ash. And this is a microscopic thin section. I forget what the magnification is, but you get particles, different sizes, teeny things up to pretty big things. They're all different types of materials. Um, just another conceptual model. These are really round. Uh, sand, they're not such round edges. Here's some TNT nuggets. These are roughly a millimeter or less, some a little bigger, and so on. This, these were done, I think, by a guy named Alan Hewitt. Did a lot of research with the Army at their explosive facilities all over the country. Really good work. And this is very common. But if you're just taking a soil sample, if you're not composting, if you're just trying to characterize, these nuggets are important. Now, fortunately, they're pretty small. Okay, that's 0.1 centimeters. So if you remember our nomograph, 0.1 centimeter was fairly small. So the fundamental error is going to be pretty small, but it does impact. Because if you get a couple of these, or if you don't get a couple of these, it makes a big difference. Because when you take a one gram sample, you don't know if you're getting this or this. To further the point, if we have, uh, say, one square from the, the dots diagram and we subsample that, even if we start off with a good representation, lots of particles, and we do subsampling, some of those subsamples, especially if you do not reduce the particle size, and again, this is the problem with gold, is these things don't reduce. Explosives will reduce and distribute. But if you don't reduce the particle size, you end up with the same problem. And a lab subsample doesn't get it here. Guess what? It doesn't show up at the lab. You get it here, and it shows up at the lab. Sometimes you can still miss it. it just, this is why I say the fundamental error is so insidious. It just keeps passing its problems on down the line. And at least if you do things right by, say, reducing the particle size and breaking these guys up, you get more in each one of these. And then we get down to these stages. Hopefully, you're getting a more and more representative sample. So this is our challenge. Now, the true and false question comes up on this slide. The sample support, the physical mass of the, the material that we extract, determines our statistical distribution many, many times. So, for instance, in the worst case, it's actually here in the lower left. This is from Petard. We see uh, particle size. This is a Poisson distribution, I should say that. And the mean is about 0.5. The mode is 0. That's the fr most frequently occurring value. So if your mean is only getting that material half the time, so essentially you should probably add this, this, and this, and that would equal this. I don't think it's quite that way, but it's close. Then you get this distribution. You've probably seen this sort of a distribution. I know I have lots of times. You go up to uh, between, say, uh, or around 1. And it starts to soften. These two, or the mode, is almost now one. You're finding things almost half the time. Here, the mode is at least you're finding stuff more than half the time, probably about two thirds of the time over here. Things are softening even more. This would probably be a log normal distribution. This was what I call on beyond log normal. It's really, really log normal. And as you see, that as we start to go up to get one particle, two, three, four, the mode tends toward the center now. And after about four particles, 
we start to develop a fairly normal distribution. When we get about seven particles on average, the mode is very close to the average. That's one of the fundamental and desirable characteristics of the normal distribution. The mean and the mode are coincident. So when you take a sample, the most likely result is the mean. That's stacking the odds in your favor. That's a good thing to do, and it's legal. You're allowed to do that. In fact, you could argue it's not criminal, but uh, more dishonest to take the smaller sample because you know you're probably going to miss it a lot. That could be used you know, sort of nefariously. But if you design your sample support correctly, you get a normal distribution. Now, it can be hard if the particles are large, but this is the, the basic concept is, and that surprises a lot of people that the physical mass of your sampling device influences the final statistical distribution. And we will prove this point this afternoon. As I said, I had to convince myself before I could go out and teach this. And uh, I, I convinced some regulators too. Now, conceptual models, you know, we're looking at it. You know, could have been the microscopic scale, could have been the, the bombing range scale, could be at the one foot scale, could be oil stains or you know TNT staining of, of various types. Could be anything. It can change over a short distance. And so if you know you have a fair amount of heterogeneity within a one foot square distance, you should or area, you should probably take some of all of this. Okay. How you do it exactly? I don't know if it takes the whole thing, you take several increments with one. If you know you've got a lot of variability within a one foot space, you might want to take increments there. Or, as we'll see this afternoon, you could just take lots and lots and lots of increments everywhere. Depends what, what works for you in a lot of cases. And so again, we have lots of different conceptual models of heterogeneity. Here's another one. This came from my, uh, I did my undergraduate in geology, and I took uh, optical mineralogy. Had nothing to do with sampling theory, but when you're trying to find the amount of feldspar versus quartz for you know classifications of rocks and things, they have these little charts. Here's 1% of whatever you're looking for, 2%, 3%, 50%. But even within 1%, you've got different models. Here you have groups and kind of clusters. Here they're more spread out. Same thing here, you see grouping and segregation. It always happens. And you look at granite, it does it. You look at peas and carrots, it does it. You look at TNT, it does it. Just the way things work. And so, you know, I hope you'll be, next time you look at a soil pile, you think, I wonder what's going on inside there you know, from the particle distribution. You probably didn't think about that before too much. Now we do. Same thing, we take increments at a bombing range. These are the tiny increments. Now, these increments are probably the size of this room or something maybe close to that because uh, it's such a big area. I mean, we're talking lots of square miles here. This is outside of Denver, Colorado, uh, just east, not too far from the airport, actually. And so we can only sample parts, parts of it. But we're looking for particles. Okay, and my nuclear guys at Savannah River, they think about particles. Because what is radioactive decay? It's a little particles, alpha, beta, gamma, x-ray particles coming off, neutrons zooming around. Those are particles. And guess what? They count particles. And guess what? They don't know it, but they have a support for their sample when they determine how much radioactivity is in a water sample or a soil sample, they count the radioactive decays. They count particles. And how do they count them? Well, physically there's a machine, but what else do they do? What's their support? The machine is not a support. Where does the support come in in radioactive particles? Well, every radioactive isotope has a half-life. And that means it decays half of it within X years. Okay, well, you're not going to wait X years. You want to do it in a few minutes. So what's my support? Time. 
You do it for 10 seconds, 10 minutes. Does it take 24 hours? The larger the support, the better the answer. Now, some things you can get a pretty good reading in a short time. But if you have a small sample, like we have small samples at the bottoms of those million gallon waste tanks, because it's very hard to get that material safely, you get little twiddly bits. So sometimes you have to monitor for a long time. Time is money. You know, everything's got to fit. You know, time, budget, schedule, detection limits. You know, Savannah River Laboratory wants 70 grams. Can you get that? I don't know. If you can't, if you get 35, well, how long does it take to monitor? Or what's the detection limit? So particles always have a support, whether it's soil or radioactivity. Their support is time. Even the XRF, when you do the field thing, you squeeze. And what you're doing is you're irradiating the metals in the soil. And it excites the electrons. They give off energy. Then the detector and the XRF sensor determines how many particles and how much energy was given off. That gives you a concentration. Well, guess what? If you do a 10 second reading, it's not as good if you, as if you do a one second reading. Okay? And the window is, at least the machine I used to have, was about the size of a quarter. And if I put it on the ground and did it for a minute, I got a good reading. But if I did it for 10 seconds and I moved a little bit, because like we did a cadmium thing, and I could see the yellow, greenish cadmium in the soil. I moved it around within that one square foot area, maybe for two minutes. I think we were doing two minute readings. So I got about, uh, a, let's see, a dozen. I got about a dozen locations because I know there's grouping and segregation. I know there's heterogeneity within that one square foot area that I'm getting. We could get a better reading. Okay, so we did time, and we handled the grouping and segregation aspect all at the same time. I don't think you have that in piles, but this is the way it rolls out in practical applications of sampling theory. Again, here's Buckley Field. We've got, uh, I mean, they literally dig this stuff up. I'm personally glad I'm not the operator. In Europe, they actually lose people every year from World War II bombs. They have squads, and it's, it's dangerous work. And here they are. Those are particles in a 100 square mile area. Thanks for watching this presentation on sampling theory and practice. I hope you will watch our other videos. See you next time on Normal Sampling.